So I need you all to sign in. And those of you watching remotely, please sign in also. All of you guys know how to do this. Just hold your phone up. And it should pick the QR code up, or you can type in that tiny URL. Then we know you were here. So let's talk a little bit about what is ultrasound, clinical ultrasound. Again, you guys know this, but for the people that are going to be watching this later, clinical ultrasound is a great term. It is not radiology ultrasound. Clinical ultrasound is you as clinicians use an ultrasound to help you at the bedside treat and diagnose patients. It is ultrasound used by clinicians to help answer a clinical question. So this originally started out in emergency medicine, and we called it emergency ultrasound, and we we're trying to answer life-threatening questions like, is this a ruptured AAA? Is there a baby in the uterus? But it is expanded to other clinicians like you and family medicine. And so you can answer questions about your patient right there at the spot. And it's usually less yes or no answers. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to narrow down your differential. You might find the exact answer you're looking for. Yes, there are gallstones in this patient. They are causing their right upper quadrant pain. But more importantly, it can rule out diagnosed disease. So you're not wasting your time or money or efforts with other tests to look for something that you know is not there. All right? So it's a really strong clinical tool and we want you to be able to integrate it with your history and physical exam to help you make better test selection, help you come up with a diagnosis quicker, more expediently, cheaper, and then come up with the right treatment algorithm to really help the patient with what they have. This is certainly not different, uh, certainly is different from diagnostic radiology or diagnostic ultrasound. They use imaging specialists to help them come up with uh, their images, whereas you're going to be obtaining your own images, as you know. And they are doing a survey of the entire organ system, whereas we're just looking at what we need to know to help us with the diagnosis we think is the problem. In other words, if we're just interested in does this patient have gallstones or not, we're just going to look at the right upper quadrant. That is a limited ultrasound. All right, That's actually a billing term, but it's limited in its scope. It is just looking for one thing, maybe, or maybe two things. Is the heart beating, yes or no? That's a limited ultrasound. Whereas a radiologist or a cardiologist or OBGYN doctor will have a whole protocol of what they're doing, and they are more of a complete examination. They're going to survey the entire organ system. What they are looking for is all pathology. We are looking for, uh, for focused pathology, focused evaluation for pathology. We're not looking for subtle pathology as they are. In other words, if we miss cancer, we're not held liable for that, whereas they are. So, for example, again, that right upper quadrant, we may only look at the gallbladder. Yes, gallstone, yes, no. Whereas they're going to, if you send that same patient to radiology, they're going to do everything in the abdomen. They're going to look at the right upper quadrant, so they're going to look at the gallbladder and the common bile ducts and the portal vein and the liver and the kidney, and they're going to look at some retroperitoneal structures like the aorta and the IVC and the bladder and the pancreas, other things, right? They're going to tell you all of those things. Now, they are doing that because they don't want to miss anything, and they're looking for a broad range of pathologies. Again, you are just looking for a specific, and you're not held to those things that you're not looking for. There's three components to you doing an ultrasound. There's you getting the image, that's image acquisition. That's what we're going to practice a lot on, because if you can't get the image, then you can't tell if it's normal or abnormal, which is the second part. Is it normal or abnormal? That's image interpretation. And then the last part is clinical integration. How do you use ultrasound to help your patient? Now, if you're getting the image and you're interpreting the image, you should be able to integrate it right there at the bedside and go, there are no gallstones present. I'm not worried about cholelithiasis. Therefore, I'm not going to order a biliary ultrasound, just for example. But if you decide that you're going to get through residency and you're never going to touch an ultrasound again, you still, as a clinician, have to know how to integrate ultrasound imaging into your diagnostic algorithm. So part of what we're going to be learning is the ins and outs of ultrasound so that you know what it can do and what it can't do, what it's best for, because you can't order a CT on everybody. You can. You can send everybody to the CT machine, the truth machine, but that's not going to be cost-effective, and it's not good for your patients, and it has risks. So you are going to be getting ultrasound, so at the very minimum, you need to know how what ultrasound can do for your patients and what it can do um, as a diagnostic tool. So to know that, you have to know a little bit about how ultrasound works. So ultrasound uses sound waves to make images of the body. So just like I'm talking, 
you have to have something that produces sound waves. And what does that is the ultrasound transducer. You can think of the ultrasound transducer as a speaker, like me, as well as a microphone that receives the sound waves coming back as they hit structures. So when I talk, my voice is hitting that back wall and coming back, and I can hear the echo. That's what ultrasound does to make images. So the ultrasound sends out frequencies from the transducer. It lets it hit interfaces in the body, and those interfaces send back some of that sound energy, and it makes a picture using a computer. The computer, which looks like the heart of the ultrasound machine, right? I mean, that's the main part you see. That looks like the important part, but that's just a computer. The important part is the part you hold. It's also very fragile. Essentially, it's made of glass, so if you drop it, it will break, and then it does an image. All right, so be careful with that part. The way this does this, and I've simplified this down to one slide, something that's hundreds of pages in a book, but as the sound wave enters the body, it strikes interfaces, so changes in density. Those could be interfaces, could be anything you can imagine. So it could be the skin, it could be the muscle, it could be the fascia, it could be the blood vessel wall, it could be the blood itself. Every time it hits a different density, it sends back some of the sound waves, the reflected wave. And that's what the ultrasound uses to make the pictures. Then it sends on deeper into the body that same sound wave that hits deeper and deeper structures. If you don't send the, deep, the sound wave on into the body, you don't image anything below that interface. Okay? So we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna make this very simple. If that sound wave hits something soft like water, it produces a black image on the screen. If it hits something hard like bone, a lot of the sound wave is sent back, so it produces a bright image. All right? So water and ultrasound is black, and things that are hard like bones or bullets or needles are very bright. Now, here's a picture of a gallbladder, and i got a couple red arrows there. You can see the gallbladder, and the top red arrow goes right into the fluid. You knew it was fluid because it's black. Fluid is black. And then you can see the gallstone sitting in the fluid. It's very easy to see. It's very bright, and it's marked out with the little crosses. So everybody understand how to tell bones from fluid? Those are the two extremes. Everything else on the screen is a shade of gray, and the darkness of the gray is proportional to the amount of fluid it has in it. So if you look at the liver, everybody knows the liver, right? If you look at the liver, I don't think I can get a cursor up here, but if you look at the liver... The liver is a dark gray. And the reason it's dark gray is because it has a lot of blood in it. So it's a dark shade of gray. Everybody see the gallbladder capsule? The gallbladder capsule itself does not have much fluid in it, so it's bright. So you understand how you can see the differences here? Now there's a couple other things to know. There are enemies of ultrasound. And by enemies, I use that term, that's things that you can't image through. So remember I talked about that transmitted wave? That transmitted wave gets stopped, so you can't see anything below that surface. So bones are an enemy of ultrasound. They're very so dense and so hard, they reflect all the sound wave, and nothing can go through them. The sound wave doesn't go through them, so you don't image behind them, so you get loss of imaging behind it, or in other words, a shadow. Everybody see the dark black shadow? The dark black shadow is loss of sound wave. So even though there's structures behind the gallstone, you don't see it. Now... One thing that doesn't quite fit that soft, hard definition I gave you for black-white is air. Air is also an enemy of ultrasound. Air, you can think of as like bone. It reflects a lot of sound waves, and you don't get any, see anything behind it. So the top arrow goes over to air in the bowel, and you don't see anything behind it. So air also is an enemy of ultrasound. You don't see behind air. So the enemies of ultrasound are bones, stones, needles, anything that's real hard like a bone, and air, right? Anybody know the third enemy of ultrasound? I should know. Distance. So the closer you get to your object with your transducer, the better you see it. So if you have really obese patients, your imaging is going to be a lot worse than if you had a small child because your transducer is closer. So the sound wave hitting the structures you're interested in doesn't have to go as far. Does that make sense? So the less distance your sound wave has to go, the better you see it. In other words, things that are more superficial are imaged better than things that are deeper in the body. Here's another example. This is the aorta. All right, so this is cross-section of the abdomen, just like if we got a CT scan. 
And we're going to look for things we know and then figure out everything else we're talking about. I call this relative anatomy or relationship anatomy. The things that we know are very easy to see. What is the most posterior structure on this ultrasound? The spine. The spine. The spine is very easy to see because it's bright and has shadow behind it. So we use the spine to tell us what's the deepest that we need to go with our ultrasound. If you're just looking in the abdomen, there is nothing but posterior to the spine that we can image or we're interested in. So that's as deep as our ultrasound needs to go. And then what's this thing over here? It's the largest organ in the abdomen. The liver. That's right. So if we find the liver, we know right from left. So the spine tells us top to bottom, skin to deep, and the liver tells us right from left. Everybody got that? So we have two tubes running up the spine. What are the two tubes that run up the spine? Filled with black. The IVC and the aorta. How do you know the IVC from the aorta? Well, you could say stuff like, well, the aorta is going to pulsate. The IVC, you know, collapses when you push on it. That's not, the, or you could even say the IVC is on the right. Those are all true answers, but they're not really reliable. The most reliable thing is to know where things run, right? So you have two tubes running up the spine. Where does IVC go? Does it go through the liver or not through the liver? Through the liver. So if you see where the liver is, you know that that's the IVC because it goes through the liver. That means the other one's the aorta. If you follow that kind of thinking, all you have to know in abdominal imaging, no, and not abdominal imaging, is the spine and the liver. And you can figure out everything else. Okay? Does that make sense? Is everybody good? Just remember, all fluid is black. So you can't tell what the fluid is by telling what the shade of black it is. Remember, black is fluid. So fluid, uh, in, that's a finger in a water bath, the top left or top right. That's a finger in a water bath, so it's just black fluid. Bottom right is an ovarian cyst, just black fluid. That, the bottom left is an arterial blood vessel, okay? It's filled with arterial blood. You can't tell it from venous blood. So you can't tell what the fluid is. You can't tell where it's from. All you know is it is fluid, and then you have to use your big brain to figure out what kind of fluid it is. Does that make sense? Okay. Let's talk specifically about the FAST exam. So the FAST exam is uh, algorithmic um, ultrasound exam to help you diagnose free fluid in the abdomen, thorax, and around the heart. It stands for Focused Assessment and Trauma Exam. So you guys are family medicine. You're like, why am I learning the FAST exam? I'm probably not going to see a lot of trauma. But the reason why we teach you this is because it is a good test, a good skill to know to help you work your way around the abdomen and the heart and the thorax to know where those structures are, but also to look for pathology of free fluid. So it detects fluid in the abdomen. You may see that in ascites or hemoperitoneum, fluid around the heart, pericardial effusion, or fluid in the thorax, whether it's a pleural effusion or a hemothorax. There's lots of tests you could do, but we're learning ultrasound. So we're going to learn what ultrasound can do for us there. And why do we start with the FAST? Because it's the prototypical bedside exam. It means that it's an algorithm. You know which steps you have to do. And when you get through with all those steps, you've looked at an entire survey of the abdomen and a good view of the heart and the thorax. It's very di uh, sensitive for diagnosing free fluid, so that makes it a useful tool, but it's also easy to learn. So if we can learn this, then we know our way around those organs. And it can help you with your physical exam. So you go in and you do shifting dullness or you do tympani on the abdomen. How good is that? It's a lost art, right? Well, with ultrasound, you can see if there's free fluid or if it's just air in the bowel. But the real reason why we're teaching you this is because if you can do the FAST exam, then you can do everything we're going to do this year. So you can do the heart, the IVC, put those together and do a shock exam. That's how we ended last year, and that's how we're going to end this year is we're going to be wrapping everything up with a shock exam. You look at the kidneys and see if they have renal failure or hydronephrosis. See if it's a post or pre Renal azotemia, right? Because we can see if the bladder is obstructed or not. We can look at the aorta, the liver, the gallbladder, the bowel, and that's what we're going to be doing all year. So if you can do the fast, you can do everything we're going to do, plus procedures. We're going to add in procedures. So that's our goal for the year. The traditional indications for the fast exam is to look for free fluid in the abdomen that is from something bleeding, right? So if you have a hypotensive, blunt, abdominal trauma patient, and they have fluid in their abdomen and they're hypotensive, 
They don't need a CT scan. They go straight to the OR, and ultrasound is very good at diagnosing that. But as, but as family medicine doctors, we're more interested in the non-trauma clinical indications. So I use it uh, in patients that come in with abdominal pain. Again, if I can see every organ in the abdomen, it tells me if they're at normal or abnormal, I can look for free fluid. That's very useful. I can use it in shortness of breath patients. Just for example, if they have a pleural effusion, they can have shorter breath. Again, I told you it works in the hypotensive patient and the septic patient. And we're going to use all of this as part of the shock assessment. So this is part of the year-long journey we're going to do, the working up to the rush exam at the end of the year. There's multiple probes you can use for this, but you always want to use one that can image into the abdomen. So you can't use a superficial probe. That would be the linear probe. You can use either the curvilinear abdominal probe or you can use the phased array cardiac probe. I like the phased array cardiac probe before this exam because it images the heart very well and the abdomen okay. The abdominal probe doesn't image the heart very well at all. So if you're going to pick one or the other, I like the phased array, but the curvilinear abdominal probe is certainly acceptable. Here's our first view. We're going to look in the right upper quadrant. Why do we start the right upper quadrant? Well, it's the most likely place to find fluid in the supine patient, okay? So the, we're going to look for the liver. That's the largest organ in the abdomen, so it's the easiest to find. And then we're going to slide posteriorly down the flank till we find the kidney. Is the kidney intraperitoneal or retroperitoneal? Retroperitoneal. Is the liver intraperitoneal or retroperitoneal? Intraperitoneal. So that line, you see the line between the kidney and the liver? That line between the lidney, lid, kidney and the liver is the dividing line between intraperitoneal and retroperitoneal. So fluid would collect between there. Does that make sense? So that's where we're looking. What is that space called? Morrison's pouch. It is not important to remember that that was named after some old man Morrison. But in medicine, it's important to remember things are named because they're important. So I already told you why Morrison's pouch is important. Why is Morrison's pouch important? It's the location that fluid collects in the supine patient. All right? Why, is it, why does it collect there? So just remember, just imagine me laying down. If I laid down, the arch of my back would actually put my pelvis higher than Morrison's pouch. So if I had free fluid in my abdomen, it would slide up into the right upper quadrant. Does that make sense? We want to look at the heart. So we're going around, just imagine we're going around a clock. So we start in the right upper quadrant, we move to the middle of the abdomen, and we're looking up into the chest, and we see the heart. We see the liver, and then the right side of the heart, then the left side of the heart. We're going to focus more on the heart later. I'm not going to talk a lot about that today. But you can see the bright pericardium surrounding the heart, and that tells you there's no fluid between the liver and the heart, so there's no fluid in the pericardial sac. And then the left upper quadrant's very similar to the right upper quadrant, except the spleen is much smaller. So when you do this one, you need to put your hands all the way on the bed, reach all the way back, hands on the bed, and there you should find the spleen. If you see the kidney and you don't see the spleen, where do you move your transducer? Towards the head, because the spleen is towards the head and the kidney is towards the feet. Does that make sense? All right. So when we practice this, you'll see that. What goes? What's that bright line that is towards the head, above the spleen? Yes, that is the diaphragm. What does the diaphragm come into? What's the bright line with shadow behind it? The spine. All right. So what's the space that's just above the diaphragm at the spine? What do you call this space? The costophrenic angle. So where would fluid collect in the thorax in a supine patient? Costophrenic angle. All right. So we look for fluid in the chest there. Does that make sense? So now we've seen how we can find fluid in the abdomen, around the heart, and in the chest. And the only place we haven't looked yet is in the pelvis. So in the pelvis, we have our bladder. That's a fluid-filled structure. Fluid is our friend. What were our enemies? Bone, distance, and air. And fluid is our friend. Fluid helps us see other things. So we can see through the bladder, and then we see the parts behind the bladder. What are the parts behind the bladder? Depends on your male or female, right? So it's either going to be the prostate in the male or the vagina in the female, and then the rectum behind both of those. And fluid we can see there too. All right? Why would fluid collect in the pelvis? 
I just told you in the supine patient it collects in the right quadrant. Why would it collect in the pelvis? If you're standing up, right? Yes. Or if your head is your bed sitting up. Yes. All right. So just remember this is four views. We're looking at the right upper quadrant here, the heart, the left upper quadrant, the pelvis, just going around in a circle. It should be systematic and thorough, so you're sweeping through those spaces you go. But this is not an exam that should take you 20 minutes. This should take about a minute. All right, because all you're looking for is free fluid. Eventually, later in this year, we're going to be looking at each one of those organs and making an assessment of whether the organ is abnormal or normal. But right now, we're just looking for free fluid. So there's the kidney and the spleen. And here we are looking in the bladder. There's the fluid-filled bladder. We can see those uh, posterior bladder structures, either the vagina uh, or the uterus um, in a female or prostate in a male. So what are we looking for? Said free fluid. What color is fluid? Colors in quotes here. Black. So here we have a right upper quadrant view and we see fluid. Where is that fluid? What's, Morrison's pouch. That's right. That free fluid's in Morrison's pouch, which is the dividing line between the retroperitoneal kidney and the intraperitoneal liver. So that's a small stripe of fluid. The other side is the left upper quadrant. The left upper quadrant Fluid does not collect between the spleen and the kidney. It collects between the spleen and the diaphragm. Does anybody know why? Why it doesn't, why? Is there a Morrison's pouch of the left upper quadrant? Yes. No. Why doesn't fluid collect there? Because there's actually a ligament that ties the spleen and the kidney together. So it can't go there. All right? Now, where would fluid go if I ruptured my liver and I was laying flat. Morrison's pouch. Where would fluid go if I ruptured my spleen and I was laying flat? Morrison's pouch. Where would fluid go if I ruptured my aorta intra intra abdominally and I was laying flat? Probably everywhere, but first Morrison's pouch first. Yes. Where would fluid go if I ruptured my liver and I was standing upright? Pelvis. Does the pelvis have a space like the Morrison's pouch? Yes. Retro uterine pouch of Douglas. It's not important to remember old man Douglas. But that there is a name. Why does it have a name? Because that's where fluid collects in the upright patient. Does that make sense? Does everybody got that? So you can't tell where the fluid's coming from. You can only tell that it's fluid. And it, you only know, you know where to look because you know where the patient is positioned, right? So if I got hit by a car outside and I had blood in my belly, where would it be in me currently? Pelvis. Let's say I was laying on a long spine board when they brought me in. Where would it be? Right upper quadrant. If I was, you came to see me in the hospital a couple days later and I was sitting up in my bed, where would it be? Pelvis. Does that make sense? Why would it ever be in the left upper quadrant? Maybe I was laying on my left side. But that's about the only reason. All right. <laughs> so the ultrasound is very good at picking up free fluid. Here's some studies. About 3,000 patients. Overall accuracy for picking up fluids about 96%. That's pretty good. But it does miss injuries. All right. So if you're using it as part of a FAST protocol looking at trauma patients. It does miss retroperitoneal injuries. What are some retroperitoneal structures? I already told you one. Kidney, aorta, uh, uh, more the rectum, but yes. So there's multiple structures retroperitoneal, right? It doesn't pick up any of those because we don't pick up retroperitoneal hemorrhages. It doesn't pick up bowel injuries. Why can't we see bowel? Because it's full of air, which is the enemy of ultrasound. And it doesn't pick up solid organ injuries like a liver hematoma that isn't bleeding out into the retroperitoneum. Remember, we're looking for free fluid and not like a liver hematoma, right, under the capsules. It also takes a fair amount of blood or fluid to pick it up in the right upper quadrant. It takes about a half a liter of fluid before you start to see that stripe because it doesn't concentrate well in the right upper quadrant. Does anybody think a half a liter of blood is a lot of fluid? Yes. 
What about a half a liter of ascites? Is that a lot of fluid? No. So it really depends on your clinical scenario whether it's important or not. Just remember the negatives. It can't pick up retroperitoneal injuries. You've got a ruptured AAA, this ruptured retroperitoneal. Can you use free, a fast exam to find the fluid? No. It doesn't pick up solid organ injuries that aren't bleeding intra-abdominally, and it doesn't pick up bowel injuries. Everybody got that? All right. Now, on ultrasound, there's a scale on the side. Everybody see the scale? That scale is usually in centimeters. So from here to here is one centimeter. All right. The big dot's five. That I know. And then the next dot is six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Does everybody see that? If you look at the stripe of fluid, just a general rule of thumb, the width of the stripe of fluid is proportional to the amount of fluid. So that's about two fingers. So if I put that over here, that's about a half a centimeter. So a half a centimeter of fluid is about a half a liter of blood or fluid. And a centimeter stripe is about a liter. Is that cool? All right. So, let's play our game. Is this positive or negative? Positive. Where is it positive? Morrison's pouch. But it's not positive here, right? Does anybody see any fluid here? It's up there. Does everybody see it? So remember, when you're looking at an image to look at the whole structure of the image, because you may be missing part of it. This is sliding up, so the diaphragm is on the right there, and that's either the spleen or the liver. I don't know which one. But you see how you can see the spine coming up above the diaphragm? So there's not air there preventing us from seeing the spine. What's there? It's black. Fluid. So that's a pleural effusion or a hemothorax. What's the thing floating in the fluid? It's lungs. Why can you see lungs? Because you said you couldn't see air. Air Lungs are filled with air. It's collapsed lungs. So this is compressive atelectasis. That's what an atelectatic lung looks like. Does that make sense? Because the fluid is pushing the air out. Here's the left upper quadrant. You have fluid in the thorax. Everybody see the diaphragm there? You have fluid in the thorax, and you have fluid above the spleen. So that's both. All right? Here's another one. See the spleen there? Your kidney's out of view, but you see all the fluid between the diaphragm and the, kid and the spleen? All right? Is that a little bit or a lot of fluid? How would you think this person's laying? On their left side, because that's about the only way it gets in the left upper quadrant. Why would somebody be laying on their left side? Pregnant. Pregnant, or maybe they were vomiting and they roll them over. All right? That's why. All right, this is fluid in the pelvis. Remember, it collects in that retro, uh, retro uterine sac generally. But if you look at this, this fluid is the bladder. This fluid has a shape. See how it's a, nice and circular? If you see fluid that has a shape, it's generally in a structure. What structure might that be? Her ovary. So that's probably an ovarian cyst. But the fluid to the right, though, it doesn't have a shape. It's laying out according to the structures there. So that's fluid leaking from an ovarian cyst. Does that make sense? So when you look at fluid, you've got to make sure there's not in bowel or in the ovary or in a blood vessel. Free fluid should layer. Fluid in structures usually have a shape. Here's fluid on the outside of the bladder. You can see the uterus to the right or left, and then fluid between the bladder and the uterus. Here it is in cross-section. You can see it on either side. Whenever you see the wall of the bladder, that means there's free fluid next to the bladder. And you can see how it's layering up the side of the wall. Does that make sense? Okay. So just remember, not all fluid is blood. We can just detect fluid. It could be that it's urine from a ruptured bladder and the steering wheel hitting the bladder. It could be that it's ascites. It could be blood, but we don't know where it's from. Is it from a ruptured ectopic pregnancy did, you know, some, you know, hemangioma rupture in the liver and it's bleeding into the abdomen? Did they have a car wreck? You don't know. So if you really want to know the identity of fluid, you can't tell by ultrasound. You have to go get some of the fluid. How do we do that? Paracentesis. So we're going to do that in a couple months too. All right. Here's our game again. All right. Is it positive or negative? Positive. 
Positive. Where is it positive? Yeah, you have to look at the whole image. So it's at the inferior pole of the kidney. So if you're looking at this and you think you see something, go look at it better. So just slide your transducer towards the feet, and there we see fluid at the inferior pole of the kidney. You can tell it's fluid outside the bowel because it's conforming to the kidney. It's not in a structure. So that's free fluid in the paracolic gutter. Here's an old ultrasound exam. Is it positive or negative? A little more difficult to see because it's so old. It's positive. There's fluid in between the kidney and the liver. Everybody see it? And if you put, if I put my finger on it, put my finger on it, it's about a finger width. If I come over here and look, see that's a little bit less than a half a centimeter. So that's why it's hard to see because it's not a lot of fluid. Or is it? Depends on your clinical situation, right? If I told you that was 450 cc's of blood in that lady's belly, would you be upset? Yes. From a ruptured ectopic pregnancy, you'd be more upset. What about if I told you it's 450 cc's in a guy that has hepatitis C? Probably not so much. Does that, you see how we're putting this together? All right, so about a half a centimeter stripes, about a half a liter, a centimeter stripes a liter. Got it? What about this? That's right upper quadrant. What is that thing? So that's liver, kidney. Right? How big a stripe is that? There's no markers on the side, but how big a stripe is that? Really big. So is that a lot of fluid? Yes. If that was blood, what would you think? That's real bad, right? There are a lot of liters down. If I told you that was ascites, what would you say? That would be an easy tap, right? So you have to put in that clinical scenario. So if you're thinking about, you know, hey, I got this image, everything depends on your clinical history. So when you're doing ultrasounds, you should never go look for something if you don't know what you're looking for because then you find information you don't know how to process. So if you start out and you said, okay, this is a pregnant lady in the first trimester, where do I think that blood's coming from? Maybe a ruptured ectopic pregnancy, right? This is a, a guy that was riding his motorcycle too fast and went over the handlebars and landed on his abdomen. Where, where do you think the blood's from? He ruptured something. What about it's a something maybe more likely you'd be seeing you see this seven-year-old kid got one of those razors and he's, skating, he's rollerblading or whatever down the sidewalk and the handlebar hits him right here in the middle of the abdomen. Ruptured spleen or maybe his pancreas. Does that make sense? Or it's the lady that came in, 78 years old, with a history of hepatitis C, right? I think it's just a side team. You get the idea? So you have to know where it's from, and you can't do that until you start thinking about that clinical integration, which is where we started off. All right. So just remember, free fluid, you know, I saw you're deciding. You have to decide, you know, where's the fluid coming from, and then put it into clinical context to know what it is, or draw some out. Now... Just to wrap up, the FAST exam, the reason why we're learning the FAST exam is an orientation of the abdomen. We can do the FAST exam. We can do almost anything we're going to do this year, all right? So this is what we're going to go practice is just practicing getting these images because it ties into everything else we're going to be doing.